Is the technology working? Got bits that's falling off my ear. Uh, I've got this to move the slides down, and I think I can move around because I've got a rugby microphone. Great. Okay, you've got multimedia today, right? You have to live in an age of multimedia. In fact, you might even have another slide. We're learning, but PowerPoint still doesn't recognise slides down on an Apple uh, computer. We're living in a multimedia world. And I'm giving you today feedback. Uh, I'm giving you today sort of three or four different um, bits of media you've got. You've got me speaking. That's one bit of media. Some of you might decide that me speaking in English is a bit too much. So you're listening to whatever la other language, Catalan or, or Spanish, you've got translated. That's two channels. We've got pictures. These pictures are telling a story. If you think it's all a bit too much at this time in the morning, just sit back and watch the pictures come in. This bit here, one of those nice, big 40 pictures. And then we've got the words which are on the side. So that's another channel. There's no bullet points in this presentation. No bullet points. I'm not always going to read what's on the screen. That seems to me a very strange practice that we have in our teaching and learning practices with technology today, that we make PowerPoints and we put large amounts of bullet points <coughs> and then we put them up and we sit and read them to the people. It, it's not the correct way to use technology to learn. So you've got the multiple channels. And what I'm trying to do is tell you some stories. And uh, the technology is not working. Okay, one, two, three, testing. I'm still getting feedback from somewhere. Let's turn this screen off. One, two, three, testing. That's better. I think it was that microphone there. <coughs> yeah, I'm trying to tell you some stories, and I'm actually trying to weave some stories together. And it's quite difficult to do it in a linear format. But one of those stories, and I think probably the most important story, is about the changing ways we're creating, uh, sharing, and using knowledge. And I think that is changing our society today. The second story is the changing social patterns of work and work organisation. So the way we work, the way we work together with other people, and the third one is the changing context for learning and communicating. Now, I think if you take any one of those things on its own, you can make something out of it, you can draw some ideas. But I actually think if you want to understand what is happening in the way we are teaching and learning in society today, you need to look at all those three different areas and understand the interactions between them. And that's what I'm going to try and do. But it gets hard. In fact, I was looking on the airplane yesterday at some of my slides and it got so hard, I was wondering what I was meaning. Uh, but we'll see. <coughs> the background to all this, of course, is we're now in a period of an industrial revolution. Or some people say it's not industrial, it's a technological revolution. Okay, it started about 1990. And it's probably the deepest industrial revolution we've ever seen, or as deep as the first industrial revolution which happened at different times in our societies and brought in the factories. And of course it's changing things, it's based on digital technologies, and it's changing the way we live, it's changing the places we live, we've got huge population movements going on, we've got whole industries which come, will grow up and then die overnight. And in amongst all that, of course, this digital revolution that we're going through <coughs> is changing the way that we are, are learning. I actually don't know what the sequence is. <laughs> but I mean, it's not, and this is one thing I'm always, always particular to make out, it's not that technology, which is challenging our system as it is, it's the way 
people shape and use technology. So universities, traditional training organisations are being trained are challenged today by the way young people, and not just young people, people, are using technology for learning. And there's a challenge, there's a, a tension going on. One of the big outcomes of what's happening at the moment, and perhaps if there's any of my slides which is most important, it's this one. It's to say learning is moving outside institutions. <coughs> I might say more about that depending on what's the next two slides. Okay, go away. When in the past universities and schools could claim to have a monopoly on knowledge, when I grew up, I grew up in a a uh, small, what, smallish town in the middle of England, a population, I guess about 80,000, 100,000. And let's look at the knowledge situations, the access to knowledge. Well, we had television just about, uh, but it finished, it started at sort of six in the evening and finished at ten, playing the national anthem because that was the time the Queen had decided that we should all go to sleep. Uh, we had a library, a town library, which my mother used to take me to every week. I used to get out six books a week. And then we had schools, where of course we went, and that had a small library as well. And those were the places where you could learn. Uh, some people went away to university. And that's what we used to say, they're going away to university. But that was where the knowledge was. Knowledge was held within that sort of schooling system universities and perhaps some clubs and some societies. Today knowledge has escaped right through our society. The internet has removed knowledge. We have access to huge, huge knowledge resources. So institutions cannot claim to have a monopoly on knowledge anymore. Knowledge has moved outside the institutions and that is producing fundamental changes for the way we live, for the way we learn, uh, and for the way we teach. If you're part of that system which is providing teaching, what's your added value? And secondly, we're learning in multiple places now, in multiple contexts. We can learn at work, we learn at home. Learning isn't bounded anymore. <coughs> and of course, the big thing for that is a challenge to expert knowledge. When I was at school, my teacher was the expert. The teacher knew a lot more than me. It was very difficult for me to challenge the teacher's knowledge. If I wanted to challenge the teacher's knowledge, I'd have to go to the library and go through the card index files and find a book in that teacher's area and try and get that book out and read that book and then perhaps turn up two weeks later and say, Teacher, I think you might be oh, you're a wonderful person. My coffee was arrived. My alarm clock didn't go off this morning. I only got up half an hour ago. Uh, no coffee. Now, the internet gives us instant access to knowledge, but it's not just that it challenges expert knowledge. <coughs> We're, being reinforced, we're having to re-examine what constitutes knowledge, and we're moving from that expert development and sanctioned knowledge to collaborative forms of knowledge construction. We are working together to construct knowledge. We're all co-creators of knowledge today through the use of technologies. Uh, that's the second huge change in our society. The idea that we can have ministries or textbook producers who determine what of the books we read in all our schools is over. The idea that you can recommend a book which provides all the knowledge you need in a particular area, be it law or anything else, is over. Knowledge is moving into the community and we're having collaborative forms of knowledge construction. I'm hoping I'm going to come to a very pretty slide in a moment because then I can stop talking whilst you look at it and say, wow, that's beautiful, and I can drink my coffee. <laughs> but I don't know. <laughs> oh, yes, look at that. Is that not lovely? Just look and think about that slide for a moment. 
that's good. Uh, yes. Now, where do our school systems come from? They don't come from nowhere. You know, school might seem natural, but there's nothing natural about it. It's part of a social system. School was only invented, actually, generally, in its present form at the time of the Industrial Revolutions. Now, I don't know anything about Catalan schools, what they look like, but our schools, our traditional schools in the UK, actually looked a lot like factories. Not uh, any wonder, they were built at the same time as factories. And you think about the model, our traditional school model, uh, also I don't know anything about Catalan, but at the end of, of a lesson period in the UK, they ring a bell, a large bell, just like in the factories, to tell you you can stop working. And we used to have monitors that monitored that the kids were working, you know, factory overseers. So we used that, uh, that uh, industrial revolution model. And of course the purpose of school is why did we move towards uh, a mass schooling system? It wasn't due to any liberal thinking on the part of the government. It wasn't due to a breakout in society of believing we should have equal opportunities for working people along with the rich owners of factories. It was because the factory owners needed a better educated workforce. And to do that, they decided they'd move to mass education, compulsory education, and they built institutions which looked very much like the factories that they worked in to do it. In fact, in the UK, we still have very large fences around our schools. Uh, according to the authorities, it's to keep nasty people selling drugs and sexual predators out from breaking into the schools. My view is it's very simple, it's to keep the kids in, but they don't like to say it. And of course, what do we teach in those schools? We talk timekeeping, obedience, tidiness, cleanliness, all the things that the factory owners value. And of course, above all, we taught them look the same. And we dress them in uniforms, and that's a very typical class. And there's probably about 15 photographs of me looking like that laying around somewhere in a historical bin of data. So we talk in homogeneity. Now, we can move beyond that. We have opportunities to break out of that industrial rust belt system. The internet allows us, potentially, the development of our, each of us, our own personal learning pathway. <coughs> the internet allows us collaborative knowledge development. All of you, all of you, whatever your level of seniority, expertise within the system, can <coughs> contribute to developing knowledge. All of you can have your own pathways, your own progress routes, your own ways of learning, your own individual personal, dare I say it's the first time I've said it, personal learning environment. The potential is there. Now look, the schooling system has evolved yet. Yeah, as a media ecology, things are going to start getting difficult with these slides now. I've got that horrible feeling I'm going to have some more. I'm going to have a bit more coffee before we get into this stuff. There's a nice picture in there. So, so the difficult words we can come in, media ecology, and how we use media, how we put different media together, how media sustain themselves. And the media ecology of the schooling system is from the past. I mean, it's very interesting, actually, in your introduction, you said we're trying to change, but it's difficult for us to change. Because we're in that hegemony of that media ecology of the past. But what we live today is a media-saturated world. So many medias, you walk on the streets, big screens everywhere. There is media coming at you from everywhere. At the moment, we're trying to keep in that past. And so we've got a split between the way our schooling systems use media and we use media. Uh, uh, and if we say that we're in that media-saturated world, you can have a pretty picture. You've got all my best pictures. Uh, I don't know some presentations get, it takes actually, people say, when you do these presentations, how, how long does it take you to do it? And I said, well, what do you mean? Well, you know, just think up the ideas. 
Well, actually, the ideas are fairly easy. I can do the ideas in about half an hour, and I do them on the screens with just the words. What takes the time is finding the pictures. Uh, and honestly, for presentation, this probably took me half a day, something like that, and that was using quite a few that I've already used before. It's finding the pictures, but I think that's a very important point to make with media. It's changing. It's not just the traditional thing, if you're a teacher, of doing some PowerPoints. The pictures are important. And when we move into that media-saturated world, we have to look at the different media that we're using in our teaching and learning. <coughs> it's a very up-to-date picture. It shows that I'm not reusing last year's pictures. That picture wouldn't have existed when I had last year. Uh, yeah, the young people are using the internet for creating and sharing. Um, this slide might come up twice, that's very interesting. Uh, uh, and the way they're using it, uh, as Levi Strauss said, shall I tell you a story? It's not a bad story, this one. I did, I did this sort of uh, looking at uh, uh, Levi Strauss's. Levi Strauss talked about bricolage, yeah? about the way people take a bit from here, a bit from there, a bit from here, something from down here, and put them together to make new meanings. Uh, and that was his idea of the peasant sauvage. And it's interesting stuff and well worth looking at if you've got, uh, got some time to look at it. Uh, and I've always liked that idea. So he says people make creative and resourceful use of whatever materials to hand, regardless of their original purpose. And that's what I essentially think we do when we use the internet for learning. The sort of story there comes from me the first time I sort of stumbled on Levi Strauss's ideas and were really excited about it. So I sort of wanted to blog it in my blog. Yes, it's a plug in. The Wales Wide Web, in case any of you don't read it, my blog is. Yes. Uh, so, so I wanted to do a blog entry, so I thought we'll have a picture of Levi Strauss. So good place for getting um, royalty-free pictures, pictures which you can legally reuse, is Wikipedia. All the pictures in Wikipedia are under Creative Commons license and reuse it. So work into Wikipedia, put in Levi Strauss picture. Now I know Levi Strauss was sometime in the past. Get a picture out, blog it. About half an hour later, someone sort of twitters me to say, uh, Graham, uh, that Levi Strauss you've got, that's the one that invented denim jeans, not the one which is sort of was the French philosopher. And he's about a hundred years older. <laughs> a bit embarrassing. So warning to self, don't, uh, don't be too much on the philosophers without knowing who you're talking about. But that's the right Levi Strauss. He's not the jeans man. He's the French one, the philosopher. Okay, where were we? Good coffee. Yeah, I'm feeling quite revived then. I'm feeling quite wide awake. Okay, that's one of my favourite pictures. I love that one. I don't know why I like it so much. It's a really great picture. Warning, this body is networked. I wonder if that's a real tattoo, I presume it is. What reaction she gets going around with that. Anyway, yes, yeah, social networking. Social networking is really important in all this. And curiosity. This is my sort of quick research gathering. How many of you here have got a, a Facebook account? Put your hand up. There's a lot of you on Facebook. How many of you are on Twitter? Hey, yes. Well, that's a, a high So, for those of you who are looking forward and can't see the results, the result of our research poll undertaken in October in Barcelona revealed that something like, I guess, 65% of people who work in whatever particular field you work in, geodiscal stuff, I couldn't really work it out, have Facebook accounts, and something like 35 to 40% have Twitter accounts. Uh, the Facebook one doesn't surprise me, the highness of the Twitter one does actually. And it's good because Twitter is my thing you've got social networking media. But I mean, the serious point about that, I mean, I don't know how you all use these things, I guess you put your photos of you and some from weekends up like all the English students do. But, uh, uh, but the serious thing is, is, is that these networks have this incredible power in terms of knowledge exchange. 
and reflection. I don't think we use them for learning as such. I actually think we use them for knowledge exchange and thinking about what other people are saying. I've never read so much stuff as I read online now. That's more or less a chance of uh, just seeing stuff. I don't actually agree with my own slide here. And I was looking at it on the aeroplane yesterday and thinking, I'll change that. Then I thought, oh dear, I've sent it off to them in Barcelona already. This, so I'll put a quote. This is actually Ewan McIntosh, who is a Scottish researcher, and he did some research two years ago, I think funded by the UK telecoms regulation body called Ofcom. And they said that the main use of social networks by young people is for learning. My own observations is, I think the main use of social networks by young people is for sharing photographs, to be honest. Uh, <coughs> so I'm dodgy about that. But, I mean, there is, a, I suppose, a message. is to say young people do use social networks for learning, sharing ideas. It's not just for gossip. Whether it's the main use, I think it's extremely dubious. So we've got all that going on of how we're using social networks and the whole knowledge chain is changing, right? That was the first chunk of the story I was going to tell you, remember? I think there were three strands. I think we're coming to the second strand here. The second strand is about learning is going into new contexts. And of course the big driver in that is uh, mobile devices. It would be driving even further if you could afford to turn data roaming on so that I could have my phone turned on when I was in Spain. But um, obviously, the fact that we can use mobile devices, especially, I think, the big impact of mobile devices is going to be on work-based learning. I mean, to be honest, if you're in a school, the fact that you can pick up learning on your mobile phone isn't particularly important, is it? You've got computers there, you've got teachers there. On the other hand, in workplaces, the ability to use those mobile devices is a big one. And especially in places like I'm talking in Germany at the moment with steelworks. Now the steelworks, they've got 220 apprentices. Those apprentices are over a site which covers about six square kilometers. They can't be carrying even laptops around in blast furnaces and in steelworks all the time but they want to get better communication with their apprentices uh, uh, and we're looking at using mobile devices for that. So I think you're also going to get a whole lot uh, of far more content-driven <laughs> knowledge happening. It's the instantaneity of mobile devices, the fact I can find out about this when I am there, in the context of being there. And of course the location awareness nature of mobile devices is going to be important. So showing actually one thing I did on the aeroplane yesterday is I changed this slide as well. I didn't change the wording, but I put a yellow background behind the white and then moved the text over the yellow as well, and it looks fabby. Because I've always liked this slide, I think it's a great sort of picture, but it doesn't fit very well size-wise on, on a, in a presentation. So I've been messing around to try and get it to look prettier, and I have. Hard words again, aren't they, these? But sense making and meaning. And I think a lot of it is with, especially with work structures, is questioning those work structures. Not following rules anymore, not following written procedures, but the meaning comes through, uh, and the change comes precisely when people start to question how things have traditionally been done. Uh, and I think that the use of mobile devices, especially for bringing us in knowledge in a context, is going to lead to that process happening. And that's how learning takes place, but that's also how knowledge is generated. And it's precisely based on situating us, on the situation where you are, uh, and on the proximity to the work processes and context. So what I'm saying is, try and make this a bit more simple, learning can take place in the workplace as part of the work process. And that's what we're moving towards. Rather than the old situation where we sent workers on courses for learning into classrooms or into buildings outside, we're going to integrate work processes and learning. And that has two big implications. One, of course, is that learning takes place in the workplace as it happens. But the other is what happens as a result of that learning. 
difficult, that's the most difficult word, great picture, very difficult word. Questioning manifestations of cultural practices and organisations. You could tell I've been messing around with the Institute of Education in London, we give you long words to use. But I mean, let's try and make that a bit sim more simple. As that work takes, as learning takes place in the workplace, it will lead people to question how we do things and how we do things in organisations, in work processes, is what the Institute of Education in London calls a cultural manifestation, because they're intellectual and they're posh. Now that slide didn't translate it. Agency, the ability to shape the form of the environment as a user configurable and open source set of tools. I think this slide's got two meanings. One, is we're starting talking about agency. If we can move that learning move outside the institution into society as a whole, and especially moves into the workplace through the use of mobile devices and the use of technology, then what is the degree of agency given to that person who is learning to shape their own workplace, to shape their own culture, practices to shape their own practices as learners within an organisation. Put it another way, if 20 of you were enrolled on a course in this institution, which I have no idea if this institution offers courses or if you are enrolled on it, but if you are and you start using technologies for learning, you start having new ideas about how that course should be structured, what degree of agency do you have, what power do you have to start reshaping the way that course is done for your ideas. Uh, and the second <coughs> implication of it is uh, about seeing learning technology as being able to be shaped and configured by users to suit their needs at any particular time. And then I guess what I'm saying is if we move that learning outside the institution, uh, we stop learning being seen as a set of abstracted knowledge which comes in a textbook and is bound up with a discipline called law or history or geography or Catalan studies or whatever. But the learning starts being bound up with the practice of what we're doing. And as soon as it's bound up based on practice, of course, that's practice of us as an individual, but practice of other practitioners of us as historians or as legal experts in your own practice. Learning comes back with that. We're starting reflecting on that practice. And then, of course, we're actually producing things and talking about it, and especially when we're using technologies, we're talking about it. And those conversations we have, be they through Facebook or be it using more formal technologies actually become learning materials in themselves. And I'd actually guess that quite a lot of Facebook threads, many, many threads, Facebook threads, could be very rich learning materials if you could search them and find them, which you clearly can't. And if Facebook didn't have such a dreadful, disgraceful policy on regarding anything contributed to it as their own copyright. But that's the sort of way I'm beginning to see learning being generated from that reflection of people working and sharing in practice today. <coughs> and my slides are rather more logical in their order than I expected, because this one comes just where it should go. And as I say, the problem is we don't know where those Facebook conversations took place and we can't find them at the moment. And that's a problem with how we semantically aggregate and put learning together. And I talked about Levi Strauss earlier, about taking things from here and taking things from there and bricolage and reworking and making new meanings out of them. The question is how we can put those micro-learning materials together uh, to develop what is a, uh, a basis, a shared basis of knowledge for us as an organisation. And I think there's actually a question in this about who the organisation is, what organisational knowledge is, who the organisation is, and who communities of practice are, and actually what comprises disciplines of learning, and I haven't got those answers at the moment. 
How much longer have I got? How much more time have I got? It's all right, now once I'm up and going, I'll go on a morning. But I would like to leave some uh, site opportunity for you to ask questions and things like that. So I'll try and, <coughs> find out, I'll try and finish in about another seven minutes, something like that. Uh, ooh, long, 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 long words. Uh, well, two important words there. One is episodic, uh, and one is contextual. We deal with the zone of proximal development in a moment. Whole file of zone. How many of you have heard of zones of proximal development? <coughs> yes, my Gotsky fans unite. Uh, good one. Well, let's we'll come on to that. We'll separate side on zones of proximal development. Let's deal with the episodic and context base. I mean, I think what happens in practice at the moment, we talk about lifelong learning as if it's a nice, smooth ride. And governments have tended to interpret lifelong learning as meaning we go from one course, and then you go on another course, and then you go on another course. That ain't real. That ain't real. Only people like Ricardo who keep going on courses to get more qualifications. But for most of us, that doesn't happen, yes. But what is happening is we're being continuously forced, or we continue want to, do some more learning. And it happens in episodes. It happens a bit of learning take place here, and then you might go on a year and then do some more learning. And it's how you put that forward, put that together. So it's episodic. Now, what's interesting is what kicks off that learning? Why is it? Now, it might be because you're watching television one day uh, and you see something interesting, so you want to learn about it. But my view is it's more akin to zones of proximal development. Now, this slide here, Last year, I learned how to use the uh, Apple Keynote um, animations. So I did this mad presentation in South Germany, where I went over the top, as one always does when one learns something new. And every slide was had things happening. There were stars bursting, rain coming down. That's my that's my alarm clock. I think. Okay. It's not my alarm clock. My alarm clock certainly didn't go off the time it was supposed to go off. Uh, I uh, had this slide, so I sort of did this slide, and then you press the button, and these little kids go do 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 and off the screen to the right. And it amused me greatly, but never mind. Yes, yeah, developmental zones. Okay, zones of proximal development. Vygotsky's idea of the zone of proximal development, although he developed it in the context of children learning in school. Zone of proximal development is the, the difference between what we know now and what we might, what we could know if we had help from what he called a significantly knowledgeable other person. Knowledgeable other person. Not to call that, but something like that anyway. So precisely what we know now and what we could know if we had support for our learning in that process. And my suggestion is that actually within workplaces and within our lives, certain zones of proximal development open up. There are places, things that kick off learning, and there are opportunities for learning if we can get the support for that learning in that process. And I would say that those, that's what I would call episodic learning. Uh, within society, the question is, of course, how we get that support. Um, and I suppose that learning which happens in there, I'm calling developmental zones there. If we record our learning, we use digital devices, then we've got user-generated content. And that content is being introduced <coughs> as a reflection of situated context. On the context in which we are interacting in that situation. This is more than the learning lab stuff again. And yes, I do it the same slide twice. Oof. Ah, oh, okay. I actually think we're we'll skip that side. That's too hard. <coughs> I think the interesting thing, of course, with the mobile devices. We have that side twice. I did this very fast. But Anna, uh, Anna, wonderful helping me, helping get me here. But she emailed me last Thursday, I think, and said, "Can I have your slides?" Like, by tomorrow. 
So I was up very late at night doing his slides, and I've obviously got some of the pictures the same. I actually quite like that, that particular site. That's quite an interesting one. It's a total fake. That is um, a PlayStation, a PSP, yeah? Which actually won't run on the internet. I've seen one have to run on the internet. It generally doesn't. And that is Oxford University in Highgate. And we actually got the hands and the PSP. We overlaid them on top of Oxford University and then overlaid that on top of it. So it was, it was good fun making that making that picture. But what, what's interesting, I suppose, is despite the millions which have been ploughed into producing educational technology, yes, lots and lots of projects, Catalan government spent a small fortune on it, wonderful, wonderful money, good for all us educational technologists, it's very good that there's been this investment. Most people hate educational technology, most people don't use educational technology, but what we actually do is we appropriate uh, devices made for totally different purposes for learning. We appropriate technology from elsewhere, and that's the pattern which has been going on for a whole number of years now. And I think we're going to start appropriating not only the technology, which we clearly do, especially mobile devices at the moment for learning, but it's the idea we could appropriate work processes as a basis for learning. So I'm suggesting that we're moving away from the institution as the site of knowledge and the source of knowledge, but more than that, moving away from the idea that you go to classes or you go to a large lecture theatre in Barcelona as your primary place of learning, but that learning moves into our everyday lives moves into work processes, that those processes and reflection on and sharing of become the source of shared meanings, that through those processes of working together, then we will start generating, and the process of reflection, we will generate learning materials, which in turn will become a source for others to learn, and that you set up and use multimedia, and that you set up whole new ecology of what we call learning. I'm glad this has been a video because that's the most coherently I've said that ever yet. So I should be looking to listen to what I said myself. And that in doing that, we overcome a big problem that we've had in the past, which has been the divide between formal and informal learning and the divide between learning and knowledge management. And we've had those divides going on for ages. I actually think, I'm going to show you the pictures, I'm going to go through very fast now, because I actually don't want to do this, but I know 30 slides, which I don't want to do. But what the rest of the presentation is about, you can watch the pictures flicking by as I go, is saying that educational technology is replicated traditional learning situations, and that we have these new things called personal learning environments. So I'm not going to talk very long about that. I've sort of the background to them. Ricardo's going to give you a very good presentation, because I've heard it before about PLEs, what they are, but the collections of tools. And that's my, you'll hear different definitions of PLEs, that's my definition, the spaces in which we interact and communicate with the ultimate goal of learning and developing collective know-how, yeah? And that's what I've been talking about this morning, about where those spaces are, how we interact. That's the basis for me of a PLE searching, and these are the things that I think a personal learning environment does. They're just going to flash past you, <coughs> very pretty. And yes, learner autonomy and control. I mean, that is what they do. That is the challenge. So I'd say actually being real about this, there's huge opportunities in the ideas I've talked to you about this morning. Huge opportunities for knowledge development. Huge opportunities for us embedding learning in our societies. But that it will promote user autonomy and control. And that's a challenge to our authorities. It's a challenge in terms of who owns that knowledge, because I can see the only way to cooperate as a knowledge buyer called knowledge commons, and that's a challenge to copyright law. And um, learning takes place in a social environment, that's the zone of proximal development picture. So if you want to know what the zone of proximal development is, it's one of those pictures there, yes. 
And of course, we've been talking a lot about practice, and we've been talking a lot today, uh, uh, probably, I guess this is my last side of the note, about an expanded learning environment. So we're talking about, I mean, there was a the whole idea of de-schooling society. I'm not talking about de-schooling society. I'm talking about opening up society as a learning society, an expanded learning environment. But that means that checks and balances and where knowledge lie in that society change greatly. And thank you all for being so patient on the early Thursday morning, the Thursday. Yeah, great stuff. <laughs>
And I think that's probably going to be the most important <coughs> discourse, actually, in cyber learning technology for the next couple of years. And I think we've just written the chapter for a book on how you start managing those processes. I think those changes will happen. I don't think it's replacing what you've got now. I think it's adding to it, and that's the key thing. I'm not coming saying, get rid of your seminars, abolish it. <coughs> and I think there's a real problem with this discourse which says technology is cheaper. I'm by no means convinced, and I'll say it publicly, that using technology for learning is cheaper than traditional formats. It does allow us to do new things, and I mean, Christ, if four of you live within, you know, a block of each other, why would you want to get on the internet to have a Skype conversation when you could walk down the block to the local coffee shop and sit there and talk face to face? There's no benefit. But it does allow us to do new things and bring in new dimensions. Uh, will it change? Yes, I think it will change because not so much the technology is so wonderful, but that people's expectations of how they work and learn are changing. And that, I mean, I think you're identifying the tension between how your organisation views the use of technology and how probably people working with it would like to see the use of technology, and that tension has to be resolved somewhere. But, uh, I mean, it is a, a huge issue. I would almost go as far as to say there are particular cultural features about different societies, because we live in a capitalist society where we have different capitalisms in Europe, and there are cultural features of different societies about how they deal with these tensions. And I may be overgeneralizing from the few examples that I have that, that in Spain there is particular bureaucratic ways of working which are being challenged and which people are trying to keep to. In the UK actually I think we're much faster at adopting to those culture changes but it can be pretty random the results. We just take everything in and see something will happen. Uh, so there's ways of looking at procedural knowledge. But I think that's the big question you've asked about how to deal with change. <coughs> Microphone there. Just say something. This is this is this is one brave person. <coughs> Buenos días. Trabajo, eh, trabajo para la Generalitat en el Departamento de Política Territorial, Innovación y Recerca. Eh, yo soy tecnóloga, no tengo cap cuenta a Facebook ni a, ni a las otras eh, redes sociales, tot i que, bueno, la nueva formación es molt de mucha tecnología, porque en principio no me aportan eh, cosas que realmente fácil mejorar la calidad en la meva información, porque cuando voy información rellevant de la tecnología, por ejemplo, en física, sé que me voy a a Princeton, porque cuando voy información relevant de tecnología, sé que me conecto a Caltech o a ciertas universidades o llocs de conocimiento eh, acreditados. Y aquí esta es la meva pregunta. Yo creo que la tecnología es un fet y la hem de tenir porque nos apropa a todos molt. Pero me preocupa la calidad de la información. O sigui, me preocupa que no veis que la calidad de la nuestra o el nivel de la nuestra educación ha mejorado muchísimo en los darrers de años para tener aquest abast de información. O sigui, veis que se trivializa bastante todo, que tú tom pensa que en sabe de todo, que tú tom puede aportar a todo. Y, y en los campos en que somos especialistas, ahora sabemos dónde están las cosas que realmente nos aportan un, una información, una novedad diferencial. Pero si comencem que tú tomas puede hablar de, de la edad del universo, de cómo si se expande o no, o de que tú tomas sabe quiénes son las medidas económicas, a mí me preocupa 
tot i que aposto totalment, evidentment, per la democratització del coneixement i que tot això ens, ens farà millorar, però crec que aquesta millora, i em sabia molt greu, la nostra generació no la veurà, perquè ara tenim molta informació banal i molta informació de poca qualitat que hi circula. O sigui, la meva preocupació és que, i tant que arribarem a que tot ens vagi millor globalment, però no en un futur immediat. M'agradaria que aquest futur immediat, la gent que en sabeu, la gent que, que, que podeu gestionar una mica, eh, ajudar a que, a que la qualitat també imperi en aquest en, aquest, en aquests inicis de la transformació. No sé com vosaltres veieu aquest. O si sigui, no, és una preocupació infundada. Gràcies. No, it's a great, uh, it's a great contribution. I totally disagree with you. That is excellent because you're going exactly into the heart of what we're debating about how knowledge is shared and developed, about the issues of quality and the issues of sharing. I don't agree with you because I wouldn't go to Princeton. I don't think there's anything more inherently reliable in the knowledge you can find about technologies from Princeton University, Cambridge University, or any other university than you can find in my community, and it's my Twitter community, because I built that Twitter community, of people that I follow, and I follow them because I know, not that they've got a degree from Princeton University, but I know that every day they are contributing ideas and knowledge which I have used myself and have found useful. That's my personal learning network. And I am quality assuring that learning network. A heavy quality assurance. That quality assurance process takes me time. I have to weed out people who contribute nonsense, who are a diversion, who are messing me around, say, good morning Twitterverse, or just, just had a great meal. Get them out. And I have to find people I know can contribute to add them into that. Now, with the universities, with the universities you're talking about, yes, they've got a great reputation, but does that mean that knowledge is up to date? One of the massive problems about uh, traditional academic knowledge dissemination is the length of time the academic publication system takes to go through, and then the amount of time it even takes to index. So, You've got that system of quality, you know, you've got the system of quality and people. The thing that worries me about my quality system is that it's very, very personalised and it's the ability of us to share those processes on a collective basis and I think there's some evidence that that is happening to a degree, but only to a degree at the moment. I don't think we have that process totally sorted out. So yes, the quality issues. I mean, just on a formal basis, uh, there's been a series of studies, as I'm sure you know, looking at uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, the so-called great arbiter of knowledge, and Wikipedia, and looking, so one's expert-driven, one's uh, pro-driven, and looking at which is the most reliable. The surveys have pretty much come out with if you're talking football terms, it's probably a, uh, probably about a three or draw. They both make mistakes. With probably a slight edge to um, a slight edge to Wikipedia as being slightly more reliable. So at the moment, there's no particular distinction that crowdsourcing is more unreliable. One thing I would say, mind, is there is an issue for me, and this is a huge issue, is that I talked. About half an hour ago, about my school library, didn't I? Uh, about libraries in Swindon, where I come from in England. Uh, and you've got publishers actually saying what is of quality at that point, and librarians saying what is of quality and what they cause them to, to uh, choose the bridge. But kids today have got access to huge, huge uh, fonts, uh, sources of knowledge. And of course, it's not all of quality, it's not all reliable. And it's their ability to distinguish what is reliable, what isn't reliable, what they can work with, more than that, what is relevant, what is not relevant, and to make sense. And the research we have at the moment shows actually that kids don't do that. What they do is they rely on Google and on the first one or two hits on Google, and because Google's hit it first or second time, they think that's good. 
Secondly, there's research shows that kids are very susceptible to brand names. So the brand name of a site is seen as more important in reliability than the source of the knowledge which is actually displayed on that site. So I think there's a big education task, uh, and what I'd say is that we need to redefine the meanings of digital literacy and have an expanded sense of what digital literacy is, and that we need to relook at how we're teaching kids, uh, not just kids in school, because I think this goes right through our education training systems, including continuing professional development, to get to get that extended idea of digital literacy to mean digital literacy not just in terms of being able to use a computer, but digital literacy in just the sense you put it forward, to be able to make meanings and make judgments about those extended knowledge sources. And I think that's probably a pretty critical thing which needs to start changing now. And if any of you are in organisations where you've got training budgets, I would appeal to you to start thinking, are the people in our department, in our workplace, capable of dealing with that? <coughs> What's the idea of digital literacy and how can we help in that process? Yo creo que la clau acaba de dir la discriminación entre el que es rellevar y no rellevar, eso es una de las definiciones de las múltiples que hay de inteligencia. Pero tan esperen gente inteligente de banda que talla de ideas que para suposar la gente inteligente de banda que talla de ideas encara aporta y fa que te con ella menos y tens una con si tienes un experto y vas y fas un pas más allá del con ella menos la definición que ha dado. Realmente eso es, pero yo creo que la sociedad en general en hace aquel gran pas de hacer la casa piga se critica también de banda la información la capacidad de ser crítico y la capacidad de ansar que todo eso se aporte mucho más no no me enjaro todo sino realmente año val no val aprenda a enseñar a los nanos y a la gente que ya ja ansaga para grandes o que toque a ser críticos de banda del que revem para que sí realmente será una mejora no no creo una tot para que ens mira It's no problem. It's no problem. It's your to show to the people to be critical uh, from all the information that uh, that uh, you are to do. This is the key to make people more intelligent. Now we are people more like uh, uh, un rebaño. It's like like that. <laughs> I hope that we change the the character in this show. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think I largely agree with you. I mean, a lot of what you're saying I agree with, and I think that is the whole issue is digital literacy, extended the idea of digital literacy. I largely agree. Si parla en català o en anglès, bueno, ah, bueno, no Jordi, soy director de una escuela patita aquí a Barcelona Internacional, EC, International Business School, también me ha un ponente que bueno, té clases con nosotros. La meva pregunta va dirigida a una mica al microentorn que es dirigeix a aquest sector, no? a aquest sector de una formació que para el meu punt de vista és molt individualitzada al començament, és a dir, trenquem o en trobo amb estudiants de tot el món i la realitat és que venen amb, la, amb l'aspecte d'integrar-se en un, un, un xoc cultural que els permet començar a entendre que necessiten ajuda. Aquest factor és molt important en un entorn petit en el qual pues, volen adaptar-se i volen utilitzar totes les eines a l'abast i amb una direcció, pues, m'imagino, d'integració. Jo crec que les escoles petites estan creixent molt a nivell internacional, però hi ha molt poca networking, vull dir, molt poca red per ajudar a que aquests microentorns eh, proliferin o es facin més forts en comunitats. Quina opinió té vostè sobre això? 
i sobre la intenció que després de l'estudiant agafarà una comunitat en la qual sí que serà integrada i aquí es podrà entrar en la seva intel·ligència, desarroll personal i estimació per poder pujar a més nivells dintre del seu coneixement. No sé, és una pregunta no ben coberta, però és interessant per al meu punt de vista. I mean, I think one of the issues you're raising there is increasing mobility of learners, isn't it? I mean, I was very struck last night. I went, to, uh, went out and uh, had some tapas with Ricardo last night. And I think the whole night I hardly heard any Catalan or Spanish being spoken. Barcelona is becoming an English-speaking city very fast, it seems to me. Or maybe it's just uh, this district around here which seems to be overrun with Irish people. But, um, so we've got, yeah, we've got that increasing mobility, and I guess the interesting thing within that, that mobility is the fact that the students are coming from different cultures, so you're, you're embracing different cultures, uh, and there's an exchange particularly between those cultures. In terms of, so yeah, I think these small institutions are an interesting development. I don't know how much mine that's particularly a Catalan or Spanish phenomenon. I'm not convinced that in Germany or the UK we're seeing that, that same development taking place. In terms of they're not networking, well, then we can say if organisations aren't networking, what's the barriers to that networking? Why isn't it happening? It's not a technical barrier, so there must be an economic or social barrier, and my guess is that these organizations see themselves in competition with each other so tend not to want to share knowledge and that issue of, of competition so not sharing knowledge because of competition still remains there sometimes i talk as if all knowledge is naturally flowing through society everywhere uh, and of course it's not within the real world where there is competition that takes place and that can create barriers to knowledge exchange, so I would be looking at those barriers and why they exist. Any other questions? Good day. I work with community communities of gestion of knowledge and sanitary and so what I find in all these conversations is that maybe it would be to start to call the people igual que a nosaltres ens passa amb els malalts que els hauríem de visar que la responsabilitat de la seva formació ara passa a l'alumne ja no se li donaran aquestes tindrà moltes oportunitats però ja no serà qüestió d'entrar en un engranatge i acabar seguint un sistema que ja li han establert sinó que d'aquí res la responsabilitat de la seva formació i de seleccionar el que vol aprendre i de seleccionar en funció de la qualitat serà seva i això la gent hauria de començar a mentalitzar-se i trobo que aquest missatge manca una mica d'enviar que ens hem de preparar a que hem d'assumir-ho nosaltres no ens ho donarà l'Estat ni ens ho donarà en un fet perquè entrem en una universitat determinada sinó que igual que els nostres malalts hauran d'assumir la responsabilitat de la seva malaltia els estudiants haurem d'assumir la responsabilitat de la nostra formació i cada vegada abans, cada vegada més joves s'haurà d'assumir aquesta responsabilitat no sé com pensa d'això gràcies com a tot, crec que sí i crec que hi ha grans problemes de quin és el rol de l'estat que hi ha I mean, in the UK at the moment, the government is essentially trying to privatise the higher, is privatising the higher education system. And I'm opposed to that, strongly opposed to it. They will announce next week something like 80% cut back in public funding for universities, which will mean the closure of some universities and the rest will become private institutions, essentially, with students paying around, students will pay on average, I think, around 33,000 euros for a university degree course. There are many. I'm not, not in favour of that system. I think that is a very elitist system where opportunities will be very hard to come by and I think it's poor in terms of the knowledge economy. But I agree with you 
and the fact of students taking more responsibility for using those opportunities for learning and not just expecting that some state is magically going to produce just the right course for them. And then very often when the course isn't the right course for them, them being annoyed by it. I think they have to start thinking themselves and taking that responsibility. And also it's taking some responsibilities for knowledge, contributing to knowledge, not just taking knowledge from us. So I think, but I think there, there is a quite big issue which is going to come up of the role of the state and where the state intervenes in education, what the state pays for, especially in these, these financial times which aren't easy. And I very much fear that other governments may look to what the UK is doing and start thinking, oh, that's another way we can save a lot of money as well. Última pregunta, ya está incorporada, sí, la última. Hola, sí, se me escucha. Yo vengo de, del modo universitario, de la Universidad Oberta de Cataluña, soy documentalista, y a vos quería donar un enfoque en una mica positivo también, porque a las universidades se están adonando a esta problemática y se están introduciendo asignaturas que se veían de competencias informacionales, Information Literacy, que es una asignatura transversal para que las los estudiantes eh, puedan mm, buscar información en criterios y el que comentaba la compañía de aquí a costat, también, que se apigan ser críticos a la información que troben. O si no, no es una cerca mal Google y truba un resultado y donarlo para valer, sino saber a quién fuentes de información de la buscar y mirar la autoría de aquellas fuentes de información, saber las triar una mica de información rellevant de la que no ho es. Y a vos, eso también está, está ayudando a gastar al plan de Colonia, al plan de enseñamiento superior, porque el paradigma educativo que estoy diciendo ahora es que la estudiante va a ser autónoma, que es el que también comentaba una compañera también a la seva intervención. O si sigui, la universidad ha dado una de las señas, pero después la estudian a base autónoma para aplicar que fue un y saber que las cercas para sí mateix. Y no no mezcla la época universitaria, durante los estudios, sino al llarg de la vida. Que eso es el que se está intentando ahora, se está promocionando desde las universidades. Y bueno, soy consciente que no no mezcla nuestra universidad, sino de otras universidades, la Pompeu Fabra, la Autónoma, la UB, se están haciendo estas cosas ahora, estas asignaturas. No me será un comentario. No sé cómo está a nivel de Inglaterra, cómo estará el tema, pero aquí han estado en Spartan y bueno, voy a comentar yo, ¿no? Que en la tira Capandaban y una mica positiva. Gracias. Muchas gracias por eso. Sí, es cambiando en digital literacy, we have different words. I mean, I just think we have to continue to discuss what the meaning of that is uh, and what we're teaching and how, because we're evolving it over periods of time. But no, it's great. Thank you very much, uh, Graham. Graham, uh, continuing in the